in my in, in fact in many of my storytelling i don't use really what they teach you in school yeah i literally just run with what is rolling in my head and if somebody likes it great it works yeah. but if not yeah at least i know i've got a story Welcome to Story Power, a bi-monthly podcast where my guests and I chat about stories and creativity in all different styles and formats. My name is Lucinda Sage Midgordon, and my goal is to promote what Dale Carnegie stated in his famous book, How to Win Friends and Influence People. He said, instead of condemning people, let's try to understand them. Let's try to figure out why they do what they do. That's a lot more profitable and intriguing than criticism, and it breeds sympathy, tolerance, and kindness. To know all is to forgive all. It's my firm belief that the goal of most creative people is to try to understand themselves and others. That's what makes artwork of all kinds so compelling. But more than that, the personal stories of my guests promote understanding as well. Roger C. Shank, a cognitive scientist, said, Human beings are not ideally set up to understand logic. They are ideally set up to understand stories. It's my hope that story power will help us understand each other better by sharing the stories of my guests. Today I'm talking to Mac Griffin, host of Beyond the Pin podcast, and this is episode 87. Welcome, Mac. Hello, all you happy people. <laughs> I wish I could do that. I am not a good mimic. <laughs> oh, that's great. I just say what's in my head most <laughs> of the time. And sometimes it's good. Sometimes it's just not good. <laughs> but I do it anyway. Oh dear. That was fun. So Mac, you know, I've, I've been looking for something in the house and I, I meant to go back and re-listen to our episode that we put, that I put on, on Patreon. But one of the things that I remember that we talked about was you're sort of a script whisperer (laughs) and, and, and I was thinking, you know, for years I taught this one certain plot outline Mm-hmm. And, you know, the one with, it looks like a mountain and yeah. it's, uh, you know, the exposition, the inciting incident, the rising action, so on and so forth. And so I was wondering, are there other plot outlines that we could use? Oh man, there's, there's so many out there. I use the random one <laughs> that I do. I, 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 I am one that loves to, uh, loves to roll dice to answer all my questions Mm. and so what i do is it's it's not really the um it's not really the story the plot that i'm working with first Uh i'm working with the character first and as a as a theater kid as a voice Mm -hmm. actor Uh, I should say a struggling voice actor uh, because many of us are struggling right now with that. Um, It really is a sense that uh, a friend of mine named Mark W. Travis, a great director in Hollywood. uh, He told me the characters are in you. You just need to get out of the way of their story. Ah, yeah. So what I do is I like to roll the dice to answer a few questions, figure out what their personality is, what their uh, looks look like, you know, and then go from there. And then I just pick out a genre and see how it works, how and, it, where it goes. And do you write the dialogue first? Because I, since I'm a theater person too, mm-hmm. that's how I did my first novel was I started writing the dialogue first Mm -hmm. and then I went and and did the you know fill in the blanks what's the body language Mm -hmm. look like 
the part that was really difficult for me was describing the rooms because mm. I, I mean, I had it sort of in my head, but I'm a real visual person. So, you know, I really needed to see a real room to describe right. it. You know what right. I mean? Yeah. No, um, I, I, I get you. So I like to do the characters first because, mm. you know, as an actor slash director, that's where I always go first. What's, what are, what's going on with the characters? Mm-hmm. Uh, what is their journey? Uh, mm-hmm. You know, what mistakes do they make? What things do they need to learn? Stuff like that. And um, I'm struggling with that a little bit with my second novel. Of course, I stopped working on it to, to put all my YouTube story power episodes up on YouTube. I got 2020 finished. (laughs) There you go. Yeah. So that's what I look for. And then the other thing is that I have a former student who took this, she was in a workshop because she got chosen for this writing workshop kind of thing. She teaches English. She's so brave at the middle school level. I did middle school for one year and about killed me. Uh, But (laughs) I said, never again. And she said they were teaching her the three act plot structure, which I know you use Mm -hmm. in television shows and movies and plays. But I was like, she's writing a novel and they were using the three act plot structure. I see how that could work. In a sense, but it, it it's a little bit more difficult when you're doing it like that. Mm-hmm. So for me, to answer your question earlier about the dialogue, mm-hmm. for me, I deal with the plot first. I deal with the characters first, mm-hmm, I should mm-hmm. say. They tell me what the story is. Right. And then, depending on what part of that story I'm at... They're the ones in the room, for instance, and telling me their personalities are really telling me what they're going to say first, Mm. what the action is going to be, what the reaction is going to be, Mm -hmm. what is the interaction between A, B, C, and D, Mm -hmm. or is it going to be the outside world making an effect on what they're saying in that room? So, for instance, for me, and, and going back to the the three act plot yeah. uh, style, uh-huh. for me, I could see it as a way of Act One, Act Two, Act Three. Mm-hmm. But it depends. For me, it depends on what the story is. Right. Yeah. How are how are we developing the story? You know, as you said, we we have that rise and we have that fall. We have that conflict. Mm -hmm. We have that reaction to the conflict. We have the aftermath. We have all these little things that go with it. I call it aftermath because there's a lot more than just that one point of resolution. No, there's no resolution. There's the resolution at that cynical point of like, okay, we fixed it. What's the aftermath after that? Right. Yeah. What is it that's going to affect it, everything it, after that? Yeah, because that's kind of what the rising action is. As something happens and then they have to react to that. And then mm-hmm. and then there's some like you say, there's a little aftermath to what they decide to do, mm-hmm. which leads them to the next little bit of conflict, right. which. Yeah. So, yeah, you know, I took playwriting in, when I was getting my master's and heck if I can remember the three act. <laughs> yeah. I don't, I don't, I don't use it. I haven't used it in so long in my, in, in fact, in many of my storytelling, I don't use really what they teach you in school. Yeah. I literally just run with what is rolling in my head. And if somebody likes it, great, it works. Yeah. But if not, eh, at that's least I know story. I've got a story. Yeah, that's and right. Can, yeah. Oh, and the great thing about it is, is that the story can be improved. Right. It can be changed. It's not concrete. Yeah. At any at any sense. So. Well, I, I mean, 
it's nice to have a structure when you're teaching students, mm. like a structure for an essay yeah. or something. When you're teaching them how to write a good essay, especially if they have to, you know, pass the SATs or something mm. <laughs> or pass the tests to graduate, you know, high school. Yeah. Uh, but, but yeah, I, I kind of agree with you because in real life, we, our lives don't have that kind of structure. No, no. And that's the reason why I enjoy doing it this way. Mm -hmm. uh, because like I said, like, for instance, I, I'll give you an example of, of my, my life in general, mm -hmm. as an experience, as someone who's went through uh, the military, who's been deployed twice, who's mm. been blown up a few times. Oh, no. And survived, thankfully, okay, as you can still... tell, as you can You're tell, here. I'm still here. <laughs> I'm here. I'm here. Um, <laughs> that point, physical point is, hey, I'm back. I'm good. But the aftermath of those situations yeah. have made it to the fact where I deal with some psychogenic non-epileptic seizures or PNES, um, penis. Go oh. figure. So... What that basically means is that my mind, not my brain, my mind, when it states that there is a stressful situation that it does not like or feels that I need to be removed from the situation, mm -hmm. I will start to have certain situ uh, certain spasms within oh. that situation. Either it's my eyes, it's my mouth, or my neck, my body in mm -hmm. some way, shape or form, or I just can't speak. Oh, so it's telling me, hey, you need to go lay down uh -huh. or you need to remove yourself for mm -hmm. a couple hours from the situation yeah. to reset your brain. Yeah. Reset the mind. Yeah. And relax. So that is the aftermath of being a soldier. Right. And you still live with that aftermath all the time. I've been retired from the military for almost eight years. Yeah. You Actually, know, yeah, eight years. Eight years. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, because I have a friend who, she was not in the military, but she mm -hmm. had a terribly difficult home life. And mm -hmm. she's 80 years old now, and she's still dealing with all that stuff. And and they gave her tests for PTSD, and they said, mm -hmm. you have extreme PTSD. Yeah, so, yeah. so, or what complex, I guess is what they call it. It's, yeah, complex PTSD. Yeah. yeah. And so, you know, it's been all these years. Let's see, Barry and I have lived in Arizona for about 27 years or 28 years, something like that. And before we moved, it was shortly mm -hmm. before we moved that her mother died. Mm -hmm. So she... So she's been dealing with, well, she probably was trying to deal with it before her mom died, but her mom was not a very nice person. Right. Sorry. I'm sorry to say that. But yeah, so so she still, you know, the aftermath of yeah. her childhood. And mm -hmm. all, I think all of us do that. Yeah, we all, mm -hmm. I like, oh, I'm like the, I like the way you're describing that. So when someone sends you a screenplay or a play to mm -hmm. look over, mm -hmm. uh, what what points are you looking at? What are you looking at? The first thing I'm looking at is whether or not this is, one, worthy of actually writing. Um, um, or if it's merely, okay, is this something that needs to be completely trashed is there something here that we can pluck from here to save mm -hmm. or is it something that is just like a complete rework the second thing i look for when i'm looking at these scripts or these books mm -hmm. is the mm -hmm. fact that i'm looking at something and seeing is this like somebody else's stuff out there how generalized or generic is this oh, yeah. are the characters your generalized whatever uh, point in the story that they are. Mm -hmm. I'll give you an example. There was a, a group in Tennessee who sent me a manuscript, mm -hmm. an independent filmer. Um, and it was basic, your basic horror show. It was uh -huh. 
dealing with some stuff. Um, murder. A, a ballerina came in, was murdered. Now she's haunting the whole ba- the whole uh, ballet company, killing anybody for revenge. Yada yada. It, it's it was very generic. The characters were very mm-hmm. generic. Uh, the, the characters were very. Um, you've got the traumatized young lady. You have the wise older gentleman you have the horn dog guy and then of course you have the ditzy woman who's just there for sex and that's it mm-hmm. and then that is pretty much it and even when i told my wife about this she's like that is so generic that is so yeah overdone that's like 80s yeah all those stock characters it's very stock character yes yeah so what i did is i just basically took some notes thought of some ideas that could help them out, give it a little bit more depth of why said person, uh, the traumatized young lady was going to this college student to buy, you know, drugs. What, what was her position? Why was, mm-hmm. what was her intent? Was it to kill herself completely because mm-hmm. of something trauma- traumatic that happened to her? Or mm-hmm. was it merely just to become numb? Because of something. Because of something that happened to her. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Then, of course, putting in some things that connected her to what was going on with the the ballet company. So it was little things like that. And I even looked at a lot of the characters and I said, okay, let's not make them so generic. Let's look at them and see why are they doing this? What is going on with them? Right. How can we bring back these little tendencies of temptation? Maybe the one of the guys that was uh, working with her, the horn dog, was actually someone who is in pain all the time because of the fact that he's got to pull all of this equipment around and now he's uh, got pain meds and the woman that is technically the one there just to have sex is actually his wife or girlfriend that's trying to help him so he doesn't hurt himself. And she's actually into what he's doing or however they wanted to connect this. Yeah. And one of the tendencies that I said, one of the things I put in there was when they leave to go use the bathroom to get settled again or go back downstairs and they see some of the equipment, the bags that are there, why not put the temptation of a pain med in there? The one pain, the one uh, pill that she went to the hospital for, that she was traumatized about. Yeah. And when I started to put stuff like that in there, they started to really rethink everybody. Mm-hmm. They They kept the same story in a sense, but they improved it. Mm -hmm. They Mm -hmm. improve the characters and the relationships between the characters. So it wasn't your average everyday 80s horror flick with the same stock generic characters. Now they had depth. They had situations. They had that that made them want to stop and really care for these characters before they actually you know, were attacked or died and even improved upon the reason why the ghost, the demonic entity Mm -hmm. was attacking people. Mm -hmm. So in the end, what I thought was hilarious is like, if you look at the original, they sent me to the one they redid it is completely different. It is more enticing and and what was funny is, is that they took it to, uh, I believe it was Florida, to one of the mm-hmm. um, film festivals there mm-hmm. and got first place. Oh, oh good. Yeah. And even got funding to actually film it. Wow, that's cool. Yeah. So that's cool. The, that to me, it, it all starts with the characters first and yeah. how they how they connect to one another. Yeah. Everything else can be changed. It can be rearranged. It can be fixed as well. However, you want to do it when it comes to the story itself. Yeah. And even with the dialogue, too. 
But if unless you have those relationships, even if they're short lived relationships. Yeah. I mean, and some people are so good at at fleshing out the relationship Mm -hmm. with just a few lines or glances at each other. Or, I mean, Julian follows is a master at that because Barry and I watched all the episodes, all the seasons of Downton Abbey. And Mm -hmm. there were so many characters to juggle, Mm -hmm. but he gave you enough information that you went, oh, I understand that character. And here's the funny thing about that. Even the supporting actors, Mm -hmm. characters, Mm -hmm. even the background characters, Mm -hmm. you could really look at every single one of them Mm -hmm. and know that they had a story to tell. Mm Mm-hmm. Even if they weren't interacting or reacting to the main characters, right. you still felt drawn in because these characters were real. Yeah. Everybody was real. Every reaction, yeah. every historical effect right. that happened and occurred to them happened. And it yeah. worked. And the thing that I love, too, is all of the downstairs characters, it seemed like they they had little like tea they were sitting down for tea and they would have yeah. interactions with each other so that like you said the the smaller the characters with the smaller parts got to be in there and make comments now mm-hmm. and again you know so that it made it like they were all like family if you want to call yeah. it that not really a family but you know they worked together right. they knew each other they yeah so I, well, they lived in the same house. Right. So technically you weren't wrong on when you said they were family. Is yeah. When you have a situation like that, yeah, even if you don't like the person or they annoy the hell out of you, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you're still somewhat family because it's going to be the fact that and I look at it two ways. So for instance, someone I'm working with is annoying me, right? But their actions affect what happens to me in my life Mm -hmm. and i'm going to be very protective of that right even if it's out of a selfish heart i'm going to be protective of said person so if someone is messing with them outside of the house or outside of my group outside of my environment i'm going to get very upset and i'm going to stand up with them Mm -hmm. and even after everything's said done in the aftermath of what happened I may look at them like, I didn't do it for you. I did it for me because your actions would have put me in a position that I don't want to be in. Right. Or it can be the fact of, hey, we're family. You do your thing. I do my thing. Mm -hmm. We do it together enough to where we can both improve our lives as well as those above us, around us. Then that's good. So there's a variety of different ways you could do it. And even still, there's still that action of like, I I like that character. I don't like the way the, the reason why, but I still like them. I still care for them. Mm-hmm. I can still see why I feel this way about a character. Yeah, right. Exactly. Even if it's, I mean, and my husband and I, I just uh, started a subscription with Apple and my husband and I are doing these uh, baby boomers take on and the first ones are the MCU because we really like those. And so we're talking about the characters in the MCU and even even the villains mm-hmm. have these, you know, things that they say that you go, oh, well, OK, yeah, that, I guess that's right. But you're doing it in the wrong way. You know? <laughs> I, I call it the Thanos effect. Yeah, really? I, I love it because... And here's the reason why I call it the Thanos effect, because and a a friend of mine put it in a great light. A villain is never a villain in their own story. The villain is the hero in their story. It's all about the perspective of what's going on. It depends on the viewpoint of said character. So for Thanos, Thanos, yes, he was a horrible, horrible man, horrible entity right when you look at it from the human world right 
as a human, as someone who lives on Earth or in the universe, as you know, someone who needs the air, it was he's the villain. He needs to die. Have all his reason, all his resources, all his uh, soldiers, all, everybody that's connected to him needs to die so that we can live in peace. Right. But in his position, he's the leader that is willing to do everything it takes to save his own people. Right. And if you look at it from that point of view, then he's not a villain. He's a hero. Yeah. And if you think of his logic, there's not mm. enough in the universe to go right. around. Exactly. Which, you know, every time he says that, it grates on me because that's not true. But he, that's his viewpoint. And so in that he, world, yeah. Yeah, he, yeah, that's he believes that's true. And so he's trying to remedy that situation. And the so Thanos that, effect. Right. So that makes it. <laughs> yeah. And there are lots of characters. I mean, I noticed these lots of villains, lots of characters like him who mm -hmm. I'm the one who knows what's how to fix whatever's going wrong mm -hmm. in the world or in the universe yep. or something or something. And uh, I'm sorry, but one, one human being or one being can't, can't know what's right for everybody else. Okay. Let me ask you this. What about Sweeney Todd? We'll, we'll go to a different type of. Yes. yes. Sweeney Todd. Is yeah. he a villain or is he a hero? Yeah. He, or is he the anti-hero? Uh, he's, the anti-hero, I think. I understand why he does what he does. I would not, I wouldn't kill people and then have them cooked into pies. Okay, but, but he didn't deal with that. He was not responsible for that part. That's true. That's true. He was just the killer. Right. Now, here's the question. If, said, even with the people he killed, okay, because obviously there had to be a lot of mm -hmm. people Okay, mm -hmm. not just the main villains that he right. was going after. Right. There had to be a lot of bad people. Right. That he was taking out. Yeah. What was that? What was that problem with that person? Was that person there doing evil because they wanted to do evil all the time just because? Or were they doing it out of survival? Right. And here's the other effect that I want you to think about. What if that person, that man that he was taking care of had a child? Who was right. waiting on him to come back? Right. What if he exactly. had made a yeah. effect? Uh, he made a the, took something, had a lot of money. Now he was just about to get dressed, get get look good for his family, mm -hmm. and go and take them out. Mm -hmm. Now you just made a family without a father, right? A child without a parent. <laughs> yeah, just because right and. and well, I think that there's something, and it's been a really long time since I've seen that or read that play, but he, there's something that deranged his mind, I think, if I remember correctly. He went so, mad in uh, prison oh, because he was, in, he was confined for so long yes. by himself. Oh, right. Yeah. So, uh, you know, it makes sense to him. Everything he does yeah. makes sense. Everything makes sense to him. To yeah. him. Uh, but it is, yes, you, you kind of go, oh, man, he's really See, damaged. He's really so damaged. He's damaged, but is he the hero? Is he the villain? Is he the anti-hero? He, he's just someone who's trying to mm -hmm. take vengeance on those who wronged him. But when you, that's no problem. I got that. It's like, okay, cool. He's the main character. He's trying to do something. He's trying to get his little girl back. Got right. it. Yeah. But when you start to kill other people because you think they're mean, mm -hmm. that makes you the villain. Right. That doesn't I make think, you a hero. Well, I think he is the villain. And I think it's interesting because Dracula is sort of the same way. Same thing. The, vill yeah. the villain is the protagonist in that in the case of both of them. Yeah, and, but again, also, depending on which viewpoint you take on it, because there's been multiple versions of Dracula, too. Right, yeah, true. So, multiple takes on him, yeah. Exactly. Right. Yes, uh, so I, we've been watching Foundation, and um, 
David S. Goyer says something really interesting. He thinks it's really, he thinks that it's very interesting when the villain tells the truth. Yes, absolutely. And, and I had never thought, well, we've been listening to the podcasts after mm. we watch the episodes. And that's what he said in one of the podcasts. Well, more than one. And it's like, oh, that's a really interesting point of view. Yeah. So I'd never thought of that before. And um, yeah, so I kind of like looking at the villains in a new, you know, I'm going to be looking at the villains in new ways Mm -hmm. now because Mm -hmm. are they telling the truth? Well, yeah, they might be telling the truth. So they're just going about what they're, they're going about fixing whatever it is they think is wrong in the wrong way. (laughs) It depends on their morals because no, not everyone's morals are the same. So again, and this is why I love the conflicts of when you're creating a villain, because like you said, to them, they're telling the truth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Even if they're mad with greed, rage, uh, jealousy, whatever the case may be, that's making them go into this sense of, of insanity. Right. It's still true to them. Yeah. And they're just willing to do whatever it takes to make sure everybody knows the truth. Right. Look at a fight club. Oh, I've never seen that. Oh, you have to see that. That is such a great uh, psychological uh, movie. Um, Because at some point, you know, an anarchist can say, all I'm trying to do is take down the people that are trying to corrupt the country right? and just do a, a just a, you know, yeah. hard reset. Right. That's all I'm trying to do. Yeah. Which is, is it right? Don't yeah. know. That's what but, Thanos is trying to do too. Exactly. Again, yeah. Thanos uh, effect. Yeah. And when, uh, when we watched the first season of, Tom Clancy's Jack Ryan on Amazon Mm -hmm. that has John Krasinski in it. Mm -hmm. I was so impressed with that script because the, they made the terrorists sympathetic by having them be children Mm -hmm. when their village was destroyed by Mm -hmm. us bombing. And yeah. so that was the reason that, well, the older brother's really the one who's sort of orchestrating everything. The younger brother yeah. gets to a point where he just can't do it anymore. But, you know, it makes sense. It makes sense why they become terrorists. You know? hey, e- even the abolitionists were considered villains and criminals yeah. in our U.S. history. Yeah. Even the the Patriots were considered criminals because they were doing stuff against the crown. Oh, right. Yes. Right. So again, it all becomes, it all comes down to one thing. What is the perception of the character? Right. What is it that they're trying to do? Right. And how is it going to affect the people that they interact with, that they react with? Right. And the world around them. Right. So, so one of the reasons I wanted to continue this conversation is because I I think I've only listened to one of your podcasts. I've kind of stopped listening to podcasts because I'm wearing my headphones all the time. And um, I, feel, I feel hurt. I really do. I'm so sorry. My ego took a hit. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I've even stopped listening to the one that I was always listening to. So, um, mm. you know, I'm, I'm, cause I'm, recording or I'm editing or I'm converting mm. it to movie for, you know. So uh, I don't really feel like I have time to listen. I don't have time to listen. So tell about Beyond the Pen, because it's been a while okay. since I listened to that first episode or to the episode that I listened to. Of course. So Beyond the Pen is a podcast for indie authors and creative writers to learn about what's going on in the publishing world, you know, the trends, the tips and tricks, as well as we bring someone in who is a successful published author 
to learn about them, their books, but most importantly, the story behind the story, the context, Uh the inspirations, the problems that they had to deal with while they were on this literary journey. So this last episode that we did, Mm -hmm. we were talking about digital marketing because that is a major thing that indie authors and creative authors need to know about. Um, We were going to have a gentleman by the name of Emmanuel Rose, who is a digital marketer, Mm -hmm. uh, actually on the show yesterday or today, uh, but schedule situations happened and technical difficulties were happening. So, oh no, uh, yeah, no, it didn't go up today, but doesn't mean we're not going to have him on. Mm-hmm. So, but one of the things that we were talking about, uh, or at least more so Chelsea, uh, who is again, very talented, very successful published author, mm-hmm. um, was talking about the ABCs of ABPs, uh-huh. author, book, platform. Oh. Where do you put your books? Yeah. What are the uh, right. groups that you go to to market to? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. How do you market it? Mm-hmm. You know, Because there's a variety of things that are happening now that shouldn't be happening, but they are, uh, because it's about getting it out there. One mm-hmm. of the things is, is that, you know, keywords are changing subgenres that continue to add oh. subgenres into the publishing world which oh. if you look for instance with um what was called originally was true crime okay right mm-hmm. but and it only originally had you know mystery uh, murder mystery and um hard-boiled detective right that was that was basics. Mm-hmm. Now there's 29 different sub genres oh. of crime itself. Oh dear. And it gets very, very weird when it comes to that. But we were talking about a lot of things that affect authors and how they can market it, how they can get their stuff out there, where they need to upload it, where they need to suggest to uh, talk about it to Mm -hmm. and what groups and how all these little things. So that's one of the examples that we do. So another thing is, is that, like I said, we bring in another author in, an actually published author to talk about what we were talking about before on Mm -hmm. the Tuesday before we talk to them because one, they're successful Two, their book has some impact on the topics of the pre- previous episode. And this, these are just real life examples of it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I I will probably need to go listen to that at some point because when I think of social media, digital marketing, all that stuff, my head just goes yeah. spinning around, spinning around. Um, and I the need importance what, of SEOs and all this other oh, stuff. Right. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Exactly. And uh, you know, I I am I don't know. I have to pick one or two things to concentrate on. Mm. I'm not a very good I can't do more than one thing at a time, really. Yeah, most people can't anymore. Uh, <laughs> it's, I mean it's, it's a talent when you can. I'm a multitasker. I'm not a good multitasker. And I read some article not too long ago i can't remember where it was probably in like some scientific or psychological magazine you know my a magazine for a psychologist or something and mm-hmm. they were saying really nobody is a very good multitasker what they what people who look like they're good multitaskers do they concentrate on this job and then they're really fast at switching to the next thing mm-hmm. And uh, I'm not really fast at switching to the next thing. Yeah, neither am I. I'm horrible at it. Yeah. So, but it, 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 we we do what we can. We we keep with our strengths, and sometimes mm-hmm. we help to we try to improve our weaknesses. Other times we don't. Mm-hmm. But. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So wow. So do you? Um, is that your main job is doing the podcasting or do you have like outside work that you do? I am a stay at home dad currently. Uh-huh. Um, so that's my priority. Right. Um, but I'm also looking obviously for other 
work to do to mm-hmm. to help provide financial uh, relief for my mm-hmm. family. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I get a pension, so it helps out too. But right. yeah. I'm always looking to sit down with people to mm-hmm. sit down with storytellers and, you know, hear them out, see what their story is like. If they need help with it, great. If they just need someone to listen to it or read it, okay, mm-hmm. that's fine. Mm-hmm. And just give their two cents to it. Um, but I'm also, I, I love doing voiceover stuff. I think it's always fun just to be able to mm-hmm. bring characters to life and stuff like that. I used to uh, do commercials for people. I used to do uh, narrations here and there. Uh-huh. Um, I haven't done it for a while because eh, sometimes you have to switch over to something that's becoming less muddy. Right. Uh-huh. Because there's a lot of people that are voice actors out there. Yeah. Uh, even though it's a small community, there's a lot of us out there still. Yeah. And it's hard to actually put a lot of money into all these online subscriptions for uh, as well as agents and stuff like that Mm. Uh, but in the end I'm still a storyteller and I love Mm -hmm. just helping storytellers get a clearer sense of it or Mm. just to throw stuff at them see if it helps them or you know they can take it great if it helps them great if not then yeah at least they heard another idea yeah and they're not alone because being a storyteller is very uh it's very lonely sometimes, mm-hmm. especially when we're in our own low minds. Right. Well, exactly. <laughs> That's so true. Now, as a voice actor, mm-hmm. uh, do you have to belong to one of the unions? Do you have to belong to the actors' mm-hmm. union or anything like that? Oh no. no. So, so you're not affected. Pro- well, no, maybe I'm you not. Are. A- I, I'm affected, but I'm not affected. Yeah. Uh, there, there's a variety of different freelance voice actors that are waiting in line to get their union uh, mm-hmm. union cards. Mm-hmm. Um, but with that, you have to have a lot of experience. You mm-hmm. have to have a certain amount of experience to get mm-hmm. one of those. Yeah, and you need to be able to pay. Right. Uh, the dues. And there's yeah, yeah, there's plenty of dues. Oh, the dues. Yeah. yeah. But with that, there's a lot of things that go with it as well. You have Been to have a certain amount of projects under your belt mm-hmm, each, mm-hmm. like each quarter, each year, something to that effect. I have to look into it again. It's changed oh. since oh, last yeah. time I checked. Um, to even continue to be a part of the unions. Yeah. And that's why a lot of voice actors also write. They also direct. They mm-hmm. also produce. Mm-hmm. They do a lot of other things so that they can still keep in keep in the industry. Mm-hmm. For me, I do it freelance. Mm-hmm. Um, if a project comes my way, great. I will do my best with it if I like it. Mm-hmm. Um, if I don't like it, I'll turn it down. It's mm-hmm. just as simple as that. Mm-hmm. Um, but I have other ways that I try to help people too. And, you know, even if it's sitting down with a, an, an author that's just published a book that needs to know what goes into audiobooks, because mm-hmm. I've done one, mm-hmm. I've done two actually. Mm-hmm. Um, but the fact is, is that there goes, there's a lot that goes into it. There's a lot of reasons why you should do it. There's a lot of places to upload it. There's, mm-hmm. it, it's an industry in itself that a lot of people don't look into enough sometimes, mm-hmm. I think. Yeah. It, it it's hard. I did 15 it's, chapters of my book and I said, I am not a good enough actor to do this. <laughs> 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 because you know trying to think of the different vo- trying to replicate mm. the different voices that was the hard part for me mm. so i had a question though are you is it hard to get freelance work right now when the writer strike is going on it is but it also lo- depends on what you're trying to do because voice mm-hmm. is not just narrating books it's not mm-hmm. just doing commercials or mm-hmm. uh character voices for animation or anything of that nature. Uh It's sitting down with your local mom, Paul restaurant. That's wanting to work on an ad and say, Hey, okay, let's go over the narrative. Let's go over what you want to talk about. Let's Mm -hmm. talk about how long it's going to be. Mm -hmm. See how Mm -hmm. many times you're wanting to do it Mm -hmm. and just 
helping them out and creating something. Yeah. I've worked with uh, a cleaning company in Washington state before I've worked with mm -hmm. a insurance uh, provider mm -hmm. in New York. Mm -hmm. I have worked with a, what was it? A delivery, uh, a wine delivering service Oh, uh -huh. and did some stuff for them. I've, I've done a lot of things. I've done narration for a TV series that never went anywhere. I've done uh, character voices for a short animated film in Amsterdam. I've done a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. So, and but right you... now, go ahead. Oh, go ahead right now. Uh, but right now it's just, now it's, okay, let's sit down. This was literally dropped in my, my lap, this podcast. And Let's see where it goes. Mm -hmm. Please mm -hmm. see what happens. Mm -hmm. So uh, how do you get your voiceover jobs? Well, originally it was, I have, I have an agent every once in a while, they'll send me something. They haven't sent me something for a long time. So yeah, I'm, I don't even know if I'm on the books anymore with them, but mm -hmm. other times it's online auditions um, through certain uh, companies Mm -hmm. to see whether or not they are good. Some people send me stuff just to see if I'll do it. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I'll do it and I'll get it. Sometimes I won't. So it's yeah. just, it's all over the place right now. So you have a way that you can find out about what jobs are out there. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. There, there's a few places that I still look at. I still receive stuff from uh, Mandy.com, which is a voiceover company in oh. the UK. That uh -huh. deals with stuff like that. Uh -huh. I I haven't I haven't paid for the subscriptions for a while, so I can't really audition for them. But it's uh -huh. nice to just see them every once in a while, mm -hmm. even if it's something I like really, really, really like. It's like I can't. I don't have enough money to actually put right. back to that. So right. yeah, I do other things. Though. Yeah, all the subscriptions that even just a podcaster needs mm -hmm. to have. Oh. oh my goodness. I've put so much into my podcast, it's not even funny. And I've not, it's funny, I've been doing my podcast for two years now. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. This next episode that goes up next week actually will be my 100th episode. Wow. Yeah, I know. It's crazy. Um, but I haven't even been monetized yet because yeah, right. I don't have enough downloads yet right. in terms right. of people or partnerships, yeah. sponsors, stuff like mm -hmm. that. They always look for. So you know how it is. Yeah, me too. Yeah. I've mine's three years old. I did change it. The host was my website at WordPress. That was my first host. And during the summer, I decided I needed to change hosting platforms so that I could put it out to more podcast mm -hmm. um Platforms. Platforms, right. Mm -hmm. And so I changed it over to Libsyn. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I have it now at six or so play. Well, eight, if you can. I still put it up as a blog post on WordPress. Mm -hmm. But I have a, you know, I have a website at Libsyn. And it goes up to both of those places. And then I added three other platforms. You know, I had it on Apple, Google, and Spotify. Getting it. Back on Spotify, it took me two or three weeks to figure out what the glitch was there. But, um, and now it's on Amazon Music and it's on some other places. So I did that first. And then I decided to do the Apple subscriptions. And who knows if I'll ever get anybody to sign up for the subscribers. But, you know, my husband and I watch a lot of shows different mm -hmm. in different genres and stuff and we talk about them so i said why not make a you know four subscribers why not make a little podcast a mini podcast thing out of that and so we've only yeah. done we've only done two episodes so far cuz i just got it approved last friday i think or something the subscription so yeah, and I met you know I just did it really inexpensive, you know, mm -hmm. like three dollars or something, <laughs> really inexpensive to subscribe. But yeah, so that's that's kind of fun to do because you know he and I can just sit in our living room and talk about a story. 
and you know, but uh, uh, probably uh, I'm like you, I don't have a whole lot of subscribers, so I can't get ads or I can't get sponsors. Yeah. And, you know, part of me is like, I'm not going to worry about that. Yeah, I was I was watching and I, I love how anime can in, inspire us sometimes. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of the things I was watching was the um, the cleric and the one of the characters in there that's trying to teach him martial arts uh mm-hmm is always saying, never look at your numbers, never look at your stats, Mm -hmm. because then you'll only concentrate on those. If you concentrate on your stats, then you'll never get better. Right. And so for me, I'll look at it for like a split second or so to Mm -hmm. figure out, okay, which ones are doing better? Mm -hmm. And that's it. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't affect what I'm giving to the audience. Right. To listen to to see on youtube or anything of that nature Mm -hmm. because there's a certain story that we're trying to tell there's a certain strategy that we have that we know that works Mm -hmm. that we're trying to give to people and we're giving them examples of this stuff so when i have like i said last week's was about the romance genre because Mm -hmm. we had a romance author on there Mm -hmm. and because the lines have been blurring uh, for a while between you know yeah. your your every cozy romance to the uh, what was the phrase we put it uh the Kama Sutra guidebook per se of of romance <laughs> but but that's one of the things we we wanted people to understand is that right. these are things that are happening right. you know people are just changing words We're like oh the spicy romance no there's a difference between, you know, cozy romance, spicy romance, and a guide. Right, right. <laughs> There's a complete difference. Yeah. But, again, those lines are blurring. Um, and seeing it from different perspectives as well. And how it's trending and how it's not. You know, yeah. this week, I believe romance was still the number one genre that people are going after. Um, subgenre is spicy uh spicy romance um and after that's you know true crime and fantasy sci-fi is like there with fantasy the last time i checked yeah Uh, but it always changes like every day anyways so you can never tell yeah right right. but we also bring people on there that deal with you know given that are uh, book strategists we have book marketers that we've had on there we've had coaches we've had Mm -hmm. character developers publishers yeah, we bring them on at least once a month to help us to give everything there, but right. also expressing the fact that we have real life examples of these people. So yeah, yeah. Well, it's interesting to me that uh, in the very beginning it was two genres: yeah. tragedy and comedy, and then yeah. it's just grown. And romance, you know, romance can be a part of a mystery or it can be part of a historical, you know? The the multi-genre blurred line, yeah. Yeah. The mash, I call them the (laughs) mashups. I call it reality. (laughs) That's right, yes. (laughs) Reality. It's reality. I love that. Yes, right, yeah. Because I, you know, when I was, I have told this story a whole bunch of times, but my mom wanted me to be uh, reading stuff outside of school, mm-hmm. you know, for fun. She wanted me to read for fun. And she's she was an avid reader, but she was like, she liked the romance too. Yeah. And this is in the late 60s, early 70s. And so she hands me these, like, I don't know if you've ever heard of Barbara Cartland. Do you know who yes. she is? Yes. So she handed me Barbara Cartland. And I think I read maybe 10 of those. That Harlequin romances are kind of the yeah. genre of. Yeah. And, uh, and I read about 10 of those and I went, these are all the same. They are so boring. And so I started reading historical fiction. Uh, yeah. I I think James Michener was the first one, but Taylor Caldwell was another one that I read. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and it wasn't that they didn't have romance in them, 
Um, like I just read a Louis Lamar. I have a whole collection of Louis Lamar, which I have not read all of them, but mm. this one is called, uh, now see if I can get this, the last of the breed. And it's a cold war. The native American protagonist is, um, a major in the air force. He's a test pilot He's got multiple degrees. He's really mm-hmm. smart, but he grew up in northern Montana or Idaho in the mountains. And the, the family had this huge ranch. And so, you know, he learned survival skills and how to trap animals and, you know, all this stuff. Well, he's captured by the Soviets. And this is in the like late 70s or early 80s before Mm -hmm. the wall falls down. Right. So they send him to Siberia. He's there maybe two days and he escapes. And they're trying to find him. And the whole book is them trying to capture him. Of course, they don't know about all of his skills. Yeah. You know, how to make, he knows how to make a bow, how to make arrows, how to, <laughs> he knows. The Rambo of his age. Right. And he, uh, he gets help from people in the, mm-hmm. you know, in Siberia who are also sort of like dissidents and trying to keep their head below the yep. radar. And, and he falls in love with this woman. She, they fall in love with each other. Now, Louis L'Amour is not super big on the romance part of it, except that it's in their heads. They know, they feel this connection. And when he has to leave, he says, now go to this town and I'll try, I will try to come and get you. Mm -hmm. Her, she and her father. Well, something happens and they have to leave this little village that nobody has known about Mm -hmm. where he's been hiding out in the wintertime. Because it's pretty dang cold up there. Right. And so even though he has made himself clothing out of the um, animals that he's been uh, killing, uh, it's still it's still hard. So it's getting close mm-hmm. to spring when he finally gets has to leave. And, uh, you know, there's this neat little she figures out how to get to Hong Kong so that she can go to the United States. He goes north up to, you know, the Bering Strait and escapes. It take it takes him about a year to do it. But uh yeah, it's that's such an interesting I I, I mean so many things about it give you these little clues about the rush the soviet point of view about the world and even the mm-hmm. russian the people under the soviet rule you know how they everyone's suspicious of everyone else and yep. you know it's this fear 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 kind of underlying everything and i just i thought about that because this is the second time i've read it but this time I just I just thought about that. I mean, in the context of what's going on now yeah. with the Ukraine war, it's like, wow, they gave me a little bit of insight mm-hmm. into that, you know, even yeah. though it's all these years later. So uh yeah, you can have romance in any kind of book. Yeah. Yeah, that that's the thing I enjoy about stories is that they're timeless. Right. Uh if they're written properly. They're, they are timeless. There, there are so many things because, unfortunately, humans have a tendency of um, repeating history, per se. Right. right. Uh, it's still the same thing. It's just a different way of doing it. Right. And we, we as humans have a tendency of not spotting what mm-hmm. we're doing mm-hmm. when we're doing it. Because our emotions are clouding the logic at mm-hmm. that point. Mm-hmm. And that's a great thing about emotions. It's also the mo- most pain in the, it's the worst part mm-hmm. about us is our emotions. Yeah. And the fact that people can 
use that to their advantage. Right. And so when we look at things such as history, um, you're right. There, There is so much there that people have had a a big part of that have helped to inspire authors. Like when you were talking about the story, the first couple of things that were coming in mind was uh, Sergeant York right. uh, during, during World War II. Yeah. Uh, there's also yeah. a gentleman who was a one of the greatest snipers of all time mm-hmm. uh, who was Russian. Mm-hmm. Um, there were two of them, actually. One was a male and one was a female. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, of course, Rambo came into play with me. Uh, Miss Saigon came yes. to play fruition with yeah. me as well. Uh, yeah. These stories are timeless because they are told in a way, when you look at them from the actual uh, storyline, not mm-hmm. by the acting itself, mm-hmm. but the storyline itself, mm-hmm. they are so important to us. Yeah. Uh, one of my favorite show, one of my favorite movies of all time, um, is Hacksaw Ridge. Oh, Hacksaw Ridge is so real. Yeah. Uh, saving Private, saving I can't mm-hmm. save it. Saving Private Ryan. Mm-hmm. Extremely real was yeah. really well done. Really hard to watch. Yeah. Extremely hard to watch, especially when you've I, lived through it, too. Yeah, um, I don't think I've ever seen Hacksaw Ridge just because I'm a highly sensitive person. And yeah. that kind of, yeah. But yeah, I've heard really great things about it. Yeah, it, it's it's a really, really good story because it's true. Yeah. It's based yeah. off of real facts. Yeah. Um, is it all com- like dialogue, dialogue? Probably not. In fact, I would right. doubt that. Yeah. But majority of it is true. The facts of the plot, the reactions right. are all true. The situations um, that the they situations find are true. Exactly. Yeah. And then, of course, there's those really ridiculous uh, movies and TV shows that we love to watch just because we just want something different. Uh, yes. My my favorite one is uh, Hudson Hawk. With Bruce oh, Willis right. in it. Uh-huh. It, is, it is the dumbest movie ever made. One of the dumbest movies ever made. But <laughs> it's got so many great one-liners that it's just, it's timeless to me, per yes, se. Yes, right, yeah. But what I'm saying is, is that even when someone looks at your manuscript, and it could be, again, a Hudson Hawk. For right. me, it, it's it could be the most ridiculously written manuscript of all time but if it has these uh these points where it's like you're going to keep me here because i'm going to keep using that same line over and over and over again yes just because it's so funny right um (laughs) and he's come to (laughs) uh (laughs) he's a nun but she's got a gun in her hand (laughs) it's the dumbest thing but yeah, she's passive aggressive. She doesn't really do anything, and yeah, it happens. <laughs> and these guys are just numb to the because of a drug. And like shoot, just shoot, shoot, shoot. And she's not going to shoot because she's a nut, and you know right. it happens. But it, it's it's a point that's like ridiculous. I think another point of Hudson Hawk that I really enjoyed was the fact that the characters for the uh, the secret agents per se uh-huh. were. Their names, their code names, <laughs> are named after candy bars, <laughs> Butterfingers, Almond right. Joy, Snickers, Kit Kat. And one of the lines she was looking at uh, Bruce Willis, she goes, do you get it? Named after candy bars. Well, it's better than being called gonorrhea for a year. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, hmm, that is brilliantly written right there. Yeah. That is the only that, that's what I mean. It's like you can have the worst written thing, but if you have these great one liners completely through the entire thing, yeah, people won't care. Even if yes. you're going from one scene to another, and again, I'm gonna use Hudson Hawk as a great example of this. There's a scene where they're on the top of a museum that, that they've just stolen this horse from, 
and they're trying to escape. They're on the edge. And all of a sudden you see him jump off of this like 10 story building. And all of a sudden you see Bruce Willis go into this, um, through this balcony area. It's not even about, it's a, um, Oh, the cover for the entrances of the hotels. Uh-huh. I can't remember An what that's awning called. Kind of the thing. awnings. Yeah. It's uh-huh. a long, it's like a 10 foot awning. Uh-huh. And the next thing you know, he's in a, he's falling through the ceiling into a chair, into a <laughs> chair, into this living room. I'm like, what the heck? How did we get from falling from here into a living room? Yeah. It yeah. does not make sense. But there are certain points that that's that's what it's doing every once in a while mm-hmm. just to get it going. It's mm-hmm. the worst writing. But again, great one-liners. Right. Great acting. Right. Dumb, fun. ridiculous points. But it's fun. It yeah. is absolutely fun. And all he wants, I think the best line out of the whole thing is, all I want is a cappuccino. That's all <laughs> I want. He gets out. Of, he starts out getting out of prison. All he wants is a, is a normal cappuccino. And he doesn't get it until the end. That's the only thing he all he wants he wants to do is just I have love a that. I love that. That's funny. But that's mm-hmm. that's where those points of writing great stories also hit with those points of like, okay, this doesn't make sense why we're doing this kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. yeah, those are fun. Those are fun. Yeah. And those... that's what story is. That's all it is. It's just having yeah. fun telling a story. Yeah. So sometimes those trashy stories that you just, they're like your, your uh, guilty pleasure kind of. Exactly. It is a guilty pleasure. It's a kind of anime is a guilty pleasure for me. Yeah. And it's, it's the dumbest thing in the world, but it's still funny. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's great. Oh, wow. This has been so much fun. Do you have anything else you want to say? Thank you for having me on here. And if people want to figure out where we are found, uh, they can uh, go to beyondthepinpodcast.com. And that has all of our links for me and Miss Chelsea, as well as a variety of our uh, guests, as well as where you can find us on social media as well. Uh, we have shows that are up on Tuesdays and Thursday mornings every f- at 5 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Mm-hmm. And the videos go up on Saturdays at, I want to say they're at 6 a.m. and noon. I have to figure it out. Now, wh- what platforms do you have your podcast on? It's on all, I have them on, <laughs> I have them on about 56 different platforms right now. Right. Yeah. A lot of them are the smaller ones around the yeah. world, yeah. but you can always find us on Apple. You can get us on Spotify iHeartRadio, uh-huh, uh, uh-huh. Deezer. Uh, is it Deezer or Stitch that shut down? I think it was Deezer. Stitch. Stitch oh, yeah. I, I thought it was Stitcher, but yeah, Stitch, Stitch dropped down. Deezer. You can find us pretty much on your favorite platform. If it's not yeah. there, let us know. And we'll try to get it on there for you. Yeah. Is it on Amazon Music? Yes. Okay. Yeah. We are on TuneIn as well. Yeah. Okay. We're on a lot of different ones. Like I said, you could probably name it. It's yeah. probably on there. I haven't, I've only done about six of them so far. So, yeah, uh, yeah because, you know, Libsyn has a long list and I've only a done them, like yeah. six so far because, uh, because I'm my only employee right now. I'm waiting for my husband to retire and help me out. But <laughs> I get it. I get it. No, trust me. I, I understand completely. Yeah. I, tr- I sure. truly, truly do. Truly, truly do. <laughs> yes. Well, Thank you so much. I have had so much fun talking. You're to quite you welcome. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed the show. If you like what you heard, please share it with a friend and give us a rating and or review on your favorite podcast app. It will help people find us. I invite you to join my Patreon community at patreon.com slash story power, all one word. Or if you like, you can subscribe to Story Power on Apple Podcasts. It's my aim to build a community where we discuss the stories we love and talk about what we learned from them. 
I offer extra audio content and story suggestions to my patrons on both platforms. Remember, as Philip Pullman said, after nourishment, shelter, and companionship, stories are the thing we need most in the world. Let's spread the story love. Until next time, this is Lucinda Sage Midgordon. Thanks for listening.